Good morning. So pardon my first, first of all, I want to say pardon my appearance. Um, but we're going to work with what we have right now. It is COVID. I had to wash my hair. It is what it is, but I promise I won't get on camera like this again. So my name is Sheila Pierre. I am your professor for Psychology 200. This is Research Methods for the Behavioral Sciences at NECC. And we will be working out of this textbook. Um, this is Research Methods, Core Concepts and Skills um, for Psychology by Paul C. Price. Um, so that is your textbook for this semester. Um, you will need to purchase a textbook. You don't have to purchase this textbook if it's not financially suitable for you guys. Um, you can get the version underneath this or even the one below that. Um, but as a faculty, we do get um, free copies of textbooks. So I do know that um, finances may be an issue for some of you, but please, um, you need a textbook for this semester. One thing I do for most of my classes is upload the first two or three chapters so you can get by the first and the second week, um, but make sure you have that book by the third week. So um, again, my name is Sheila. This is Research Methods for the Behavioral Sciences. You know the textbook that um, you will need to acquire for this class. Um, in regards to that textbook, furthermore, you can down, um, sorry, you can purchase it off of Amazon, eBay, or through the publisher itself. The publisher is Flat World. They do have a digital format that is cheap um, if you choose to do that. Um, but for this lecture, let's just get into the lecture and let me get off camera. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, the lecture will take um, a similar format every single time. I will get online. I will um, tell you things that you need to do um, in preparation for the week. And at the end, I will also tell you things you need to do for um, that need to be finalized for the week, as well as things for the upcoming week, and then lecture. Okay, so right now what I want to do um, is to share my screen with you guys. Um, you guys have access to, where's the full screen? You guys have access, full screen. Um, you guys have access to this PowerPoint lecture. Um, you have access to all of my PowerPoints every single week. So that should be no issue. Um, chapter one, um, for some of you, depending on the book version that you have, is entitled The Science of Psychology. However, if you have the updated one, which just updated as of December 2000 and January 2020, it is, your chapter is entitled Scientific Psychology. It's the same thing. Um, the titles have changed for the recent, the updated version, okay? So quickly, psychology is usually defined as a scientific study of human behavior, of human behavior and the mental processes, which includes features such as experiments, um, research, and empirical data. This first chapter, chapter one, is going to look at these features that I just mentioned, introduce the model, of scientific research in psychology and address several basic questions that students have, that your professors have, that psychologists have, and even people in other soft sciences such as sociology, social psych, etc. Okay, so let's get into chapter one. Um, your chapter um, will always list the objectives that you need to take away. Um, I have listed these objectives on Blackboard in a more synchronized um, fashion. There are a lot that the book mentions, um, but just go to Blackboard, but do go over the PowerPoint lecture on your own, go over the learning objectives and make sure you come out of reading every single chapter knowing the main points, what the author is trying to get across, et cetera, okay? 
So what is science? Psychology obviously is a science. It's why we're sitting in, we're not sitting in a class, but it's why we're learning psychology, right? It's a science. But what makes it a science, right? Um, philosophers and scientists believe that what the sciences have in common is a very general approach to understanding the natural world. Psychology, as I said, is a science because it takes the same general approach to understanding one aspect of the natural world, and that aspect is human behavior, okay? So psychology, your book defines as a scientific study of human behavior and mental processes. Science is defined as a general way of understanding the natural world. And um, when we talk about the general scientific approach, right, the general scientific approach is what makes psychology a science, right? The general scientific approach has three functions, and these functions, again, make psychology a science. Systematic empiricism, empirically testable questions, and public knowledge, right? The first, systematic empiricism, which is learning based on observation. And scientists learn about the natural world by carefully um, planning, making recordings, and even analyzing observations of those recordings, right? Quickly, the next PowerPoint slide, I'm gonna jump back and forth. But the features of science, the first one, as I said, is systematic empiricism, right? It's learning about the um, world through careful observation. This is what also, this is one, right, aspect that makes psychology a science, right? Through, so it has, it encompasses systematic empiricism. The second is concerned with empirical questions. Okay, questions about the way the world actually is and therefore can be answered by systematically observing it. Okay, empirically testable questions, right? These are questions about the world, the way the world actually is that can be answered by making systematic observations. That is the second aspect of what makes psychology a science. And then the last is, um, which is the third, is that through all of this, right, systematic empiricism, um, empirically testable questions, or creating empirical questions, you're able, and psychology is able to create public knowledge through all of this. So third, it creates public knowledge, which is usually means writing an article, um, for publication in a professional journal, um, in a professional source, putting research questions in the context of previous research and describing it in detail, the methods that the authors use, um, they're answering the questions and clearly um, presenting the results and the conclusions. This creates public knowledge. So public knowledge, again, on our screen, detailed descriptions of research that are available to other researchers and the general public. So these three features of science are features that you can find in psychology, therefore making it a science, okay? I do, before I get on to this second aspect, right, um, science versus pseudoscience, I do want to quickly mention that publications are important, right? to have your psychology piece, your psychological piece published is very important. Publications are important because science is a social process, okay? And think about that, right? What makes science a social process? Um, there is a need for collaborative effort, right? Making it a social process. And because it, it allows for self-correction. The scientific community can detect and correct errors through their own methods, okay? So creating public knowledge through publications allows psychology and fields like psychology, sociology, social psych, social work, 
um, through these creative, um, sorry, through public knowledge and the creation of public knowledge, we can also correct ourselves through our own methods. So it is important to um, publish your work. But again, what I want you to get out of this first part in chapter one is what is science? What makes psychology a science? And what are the three features of a science, okay? So the next aspect I want to go on to, or the next part of the chapter um, that I want to dive into is science. So psychology as a science versus pseudosciences, right? So pseudoscience refers to activities and beliefs that are claimed to be scientific by their adherents, so by the people who believe them, and may appear to be science at first glance, but they're not. So um, your book defines a pseudoscience as a set of beliefs or activities that is claimed to be scientific, but lacks one or more of the three features of science. Those three features we just went over, or I just went over, okay? So again, it's adherents claim and imply that it is science. So they're adamant that it is science. And two, it lacks one or more of the three features of science. So the reason why pseudosciences are pseudosciences is because it could be lacking um, scientific empiricism. It could be lacking an empirical question, et cetera, okay? Um, a set of beliefs and activities might also be pseudoscientific because it does not adhere to empirically testable questions which is a big aspect. So it's that second um, part of making, it's that second um, aspect of a science that is vital to whether or not something is considered a pseudoscience. Um, why is it important to learn the difference between science and pseudoscience, right? One, um, it helps bring the fundamental features of science and their importance into sharper focus. So by knowing what a pseudoscience is, you know what is scientific and what is not, okay? And two, it can help to identify and evaluate beliefs such as biorhythms, psych psychic powers, um, astrology, and many other pseudoscientific beliefs and practices when we encounter them. So you'll know the difference between something that is scientific and something that is pseudoscience, okay? Um, the next part of your textbook goes into the model of scientific research and psychology, right? And to explain this part of the chapter, um, I'm just going to use the figure, right? There is really no need to um, go into extensive um, PowerPoint notes, et cetera. But um, so here you have a simple model of scientific research in psychology. The first step when going into this mode of research is that as a researcher, you as students in Psychology 200 will need to formulate a research question, okay? This week, for this, um, week in our psychology class, right? You have a discussion board. That discussion board, in that discussion board, I ask you to introduce yourself, but also think about a topic that you would like to research on your own for the remainder of the semester, right? That's going to be, hopefully, right? The question that you post into the discussion board is going to be the question that you stick with for the, the remainder of the semester. If not, that's okay, but it's to get you thinking, right? Then, as researchers, we need to find literature pertaining to that research question. This is always going to be happening throughout the research process, okay? You're constantly going to be going back to steps one and steps two. So formulating a research question and the literature review. Sometimes after going through the literature around your research question, you might have to go back to your research question and reframe it, okay? 
So the researcher formulates a research question and then goes to the literature review and then needs to conduct or design, right? Conduct or design a study designed to answer that research question, okay? So we are going to get into all of that slowly and piece by piece um, when the chapters progress, when the weeks progress, right? The fourth step is to analyze the resulting data after you've designed and conducted your study. You're going to then draw conclusions about the answers to that original question. And hopefully at the end of the day, after everything, you've gone over everything, everything looks good, you're going to publish your results so that they can become part of the larger research literature that now you've just incorporated, that you've just contributed to, okay? So this is the depiction of a simple model of scientific research. You in this class are only going to go over steps one, two, and three, right? So you're gonna develop a research question, do a literature review, and design. We're gonna end at designing the research project. Hence why it's called a research proposal, okay? So who conducts research in psychology, okay? This is important, okay? Because a lot of people think that, you know, you only have to be a doctor. Um, and when I say doctor, I'm inclusive with this. I'm not talking about a doctor in the medical field, but the PhD to you only have to be, you have to be that to contribute in research in psychology. That's not the case, right? But who conducts scientific research in psychology? Scientific research in psychology is conducted by people with doctoral degrees who work for government agencies, nonprofit organizations, think tanks, um, the private sector, et cetera, right? However, the majority of people who conduct scientific research usually can be found in colleges and universities around the world, around our country, okay? Usually these people are faculty, but faculty often also collaborate with undergrads and graduate students. So some of these pieces that you have used in your site papers on, below the 200 level, right? or at the 200 level have been written by not only faculty, but also undergrads, okay? It is possible for you to get a publishable paper after taking a psych course, okay? Um, some researchers are trained and licensed also clinicians, okay? So these are the types of people who, um, conduct scientific research, okay? Um, also quickly, before going on further, um, people, conduct psychs, um, people conduct research in psychology because they genuinely enjoy it. It might sound weird, but your faculty members enjoy researching. A lot of these faculty at four-year colleges enjoy what they do, okay? Um, they enjoy the technological challenges involved and the satisfaction of contributing to their area of research, okay? The next part that I would want to go into quickly or the next part of your chapter I want to go over is um, common sense. Right, when it comes to the soft sciences, um, some people will actually, and this goes along with psychology and sociology a lot, right? Common sense, right? Some people wonder whether the scientific approach to psychology is necessary. Okay? Because understanding human behavior can seem like a matter of common sense. Okay? 
a lot of things in psychology and sociology do seem to be common sense, right? Um, but can we rely on just common sense? Do we need a scientific approach, okay? You are introduced to the concept of folk um, psychology, right? Intuitive beliefs about people's behaviors, thoughts, and feelings are collectively referred to as folk psychology. Although um, much of our folk psychology is probably reasonably um, accurate, it is clear that much of it is not. Much of folk psychology we can't depend on, okay? So, um, your textbook is going to talk about in 50 Great Myths of Popular Psychology, psychologists Scott Linfield and colleagues discuss several widely held common sense beliefs, um, specifically beliefs about human behavior and scientific research, which has been shown to be incorrect. There are several reasons due to which many of our intuitive beliefs about human behavior are often wrong, okay? The first major one, and these are all of them, but the first major one is forming detailed, accurate beliefs require powers of observation, memory, and statistical analysis, which we simply do not naturally possess, okay? So we don't naturally possess um, great skills of observation. Hence why you are taking a research methods class, okay? We learn, we will learn different skills to become great observers, to be able to observe properly and accurately for the specific fields that you're in, okay? We also don't have great memories, okay? And on top of that, um, Statistical analysis, you, I believe, you have to take a stats class to even enter this course. And still, after taking stats class, people still have problem with, problems with statistical analysis, okay? So there's one reason why we can't rely on this common sense thing, okay? We view things differently, and that's why we kind of need a scientific approach, okay? Also, um, we also need to focus on things that confirm our intuitive beliefs. This is called confirmation bias. Your book specifically defines confirmation bias as the tendency to notice and remember evidence that is consistent with what we already believe and to ignore evidence that is inconsistent. We are flawed human beings, okay? So as flawed human beings, can we be biased in our work? Yes, I am biased in my work, but I acknowledge it, okay? And usually in, it should be a common practice, but in, um, psychological pieces, sociological pieces, there always is a limitation section where that author or those authors discuss their limitations when they're studying and it can include some of their biases, okay? Since scientists understand that they're, um, they are susceptible to intuitive beliefs, right? Confirmation bias, they cultivate an abd, you have to cultivate an attitude of skepticism, okay? Which means pursuing to consider alternatives and search for evidence, okay? You really have to step out of your body, step out of your comfort zone, step, do not rely on your own common sense. Be a skeptic, look for alternatives. Okay. Because there is not often evidence to choose among alternative answers to a psychological question, scientists also need to cultivate tolerance for 
uncertainty, okay? They accept that there are many things that we simply don't understand, okay? Such an uncertainty is exciting from a scientific perspective though, okay? Sorry, I talked beyond these slides, but you have these slides, make sure you're going over them. Science and clinical practice is, I believe, one of the last sections that your textbook, it is the last section that your textbook goes over, right? Psychology is, again, the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. Remember that, okay? It is also the application of scientific research to help people. Most of you are in this class to help people. Okay, to help organizations and communities, ultimately to help all of these types of bodies of these people to function well. Okay, the term clinical practice of psychology broadly refers to the activities of clinical and counseling psychologists, school psychologists, marriage and family therapists, licensed clinical social workers, and others who work with people individually or in small groups to identify and solve their psychological problems. Okay. It's important, it, so it has important implications for undergraduates, many of whom are interested in clinical careers. Okay, many of you coming into um, research 200 or psych 200 are interested in this stuff. I know um, in my face-to-face -face classes, a lot of people wanted to be school, um, school psychologists, right? Wanted to work in some type of counseling, whether it be marriage or relationship, et cetera. This might change later on in the semester, you never know, okay? Um, most importantly, psychological disorders and other behavioral problems are features of the natural world and questions about their nature, causes, and consequences are empirically testable and therefore subject to scientific study. Dozens of books and websites claim that adult children of alcoholics, for example, have distinct personality profiles, which include low self-esteem, feelings of powerlessness, and assumptions that are disapproved by plausible scientific research. Questions about whether or not their particular psych um, psychotherapy works are empirically testable questions that can be answered by scientific research, okay? Um, empirically supported um, treatment. An empirically supported treatment is one that has been studied scientifically and shown to result in greater improvement than no treatment, a placebo, or some alternative treatment. These include many forms of um, psychotherapy, which can be effective as standard drug therapies. Forms of psychotherapy um, with strong empirical support include cognitive behavior therapy for depression, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, et cetera. Okay, and your book has a list um, of places where this can be found, okay? So one thing I do want you to get out, let me stop sharing my screen real quick. One thing I want you to get out of this, right? Not get out of it, but I want you to think of, after going over our definitions of psychology, our definitions of sciences, what makes psychology a science? How to, the steps, not how to, but the steps of researching, um, the difference between pseudoscience and sciences and then jumping into where you or where a majority of students want to go when it pertains to psychology and a career in psychology. I want you guys to think about this question and there's no right answer to this question, right? But some clinicians argue that what they do is an art form based on intuition 
and personal experience and therefore cannot be evaluated scientifically. And you might fall into this realm, okay? Think about how satisfied you would be with a clinician who takes this perspective and why from three perspectives, okay, how would a potential client of a clinician view this person? How would a judge, the judge who orders somebody to therapy, view this person? How would an insurance company view this person? Okay. Just something to think about. But that's an overview of chapter one. Okay, so that's an overview of chapter one. Very basic, there is no quiz this week. There is a discussion board. So make sure you go to the discussion board, um, participate. I need your name. I also need um, what, you, what you are interested in studying this semester. I will be active in that discussion board. Um, I might even reframe some of your questions just to make them more researchable and you guys will see why they're reframed in our following in our next chapter. Um, but that's all you have to do for this week. And that is lecture one. I promise I won't come on camera like this again. Um, but yeah, that's our lecture for today. Sound good? Bye guys. Peace.